So the last time I was on stage was um, <clears throat> sixth grade, spelling bee. Um, and like all good sixth graders, I studied these words really hard. And my first word was author. And I spelled it O-U-T-H-E-R. Um, and it's not even a good spelling. I mean, you can't even do anything with this. It wasn't even like O-A-T-H-E-R, which is like, you know, a respectable job description. You know, if you could be an author, you could go take oaths and leave oaths somewhere and show up at kids' birthday parties and stand in the back of the room and make ill-advised comments when, you know, your son can't hit the pinata well. Um, so I was pretty much, there was no way I was actually going to be an author because I couldn't spell it. So I decided instead to be a writer because there's fewer vowels. And because writers also... Writers live by ideas. That's all they do all day long. And people ask me, where do you get your ideas? And I try really hard not to laugh at them because, frankly, where don't I get ideas? I mean, I look out the back window and I see a bunch of moles on meth making things in the backyard. I open the kitchen drawer for a spoon and I see two ideas banging against each other, making more ideas. I mean, they're, they're constantly they're like, you know, like rabbits. And even sometimes, you know, ideas show up in really awkward places. And, you know, you don't really ever have a pencil in a shower um, and your phone doesn't work. So ideas, ideas are everywhere. And, and the thing about ideas is that, especially for writers, is that we see and dream and live through narrative. Everywhere we go, we see narrative. We see people staring off into space. And we don't see them staring off into space. We see them thinking about what's for lunch or, hey, what's going on over there? Or, my, look at my, you know... I don't know what the hell he's thinking about. But this gentleman right here, he's thinking to himself, is it three over and four down for a bleep? Or is it three over and four down for a bloop? And frankly, I'm inventing modern avant-garde electronic music, so what the fuck? Let's just plug it in and see what happens, right? <laughs> because that's the thing about ideas, is that you've got you've to harness them. You've got to catch them. You've got to be grabbing them all the time. And some of them, you've got to sit there and look at them. You go, well, this one's too small. I'm going to throw this one back. This one I'm going to keep. Maybe I'll save it and put it up on the mantelpiece, and maybe I'll shave this one and turn it into a hat and some mittens. They're constantly coming on. And because it's your brain is doing amazing things all the time, it's these little sparks that are happening all, all the time. And, and it started back when we were all knuckle-draggers, right? And then one of them stood up in the back of the, back of the cave one morning and said, hey, hey, I've got an idea. You know, and if Thog hadn't looked at that burning bush and thought, hey, it's kind of warm. I wonder what happens if I touch it civilization probably wouldn't have happened. You know, and, and frankly, if Thog hadn't had that same thought the first time he saw a naked woman, civilization probably wouldn't have happened either. <laughs> so anyway, we left the cave, and we started building houses, and we started building castles, and we started building cathedrals. And, and you move along to a point where, you know, we're in the 17th century, and the Pope looks up at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and says, it's a fabulous ceiling, but you know what it needs? It needs some angels. It needs something up there. And some dude in the back of the room put up his hand up and says, I'll see your angels and raise you the book of Genesis. Right? And the Pope, being a smart guy, said, all right, let's see what you got. Because that's what makes the difference. That's what leads us through to, to tomorrow. That's how we get from over there to over there. We ask questions. We wonder. We speculate on what if. And we want to see what the possibilities could be. I mean, last week, we recorded gravitational waves, right? Some scientists got a measurement out and said, look, there are two black holes colliding. I'm getting a reading. And you know who wasn't surprised by this reading? Albert Einstein, right? 100 years ago, he said, you know what? Someday they're going to see gravitational waves, and they're going to pull this note out of my drawer, and I'm going to be right. <laughs> and it took us a century. It took us a century to catch up with him. But he dared to question the universe. He dared to look forward and say, you know what? I think something's different out there. And that's a lot of the reason why we invented language. I mean, part of it was to leave the cave and go find the river and come back and say, hey, the river's over there, and the mammoths are pooping over there, and the tasty marmots that we like are living over here. But part of it's also is that there were things going on in our brain. There were things that were changing, things that were magical, and things that were different, and we wanted to share those with each other. And that's why, that's why we create. That's why we're, we're dreamers. That's why we write. That's why I, I write. That's why I, I'm a publisher as well, because, frankly, if you write, you've got to put it down. You've got to put it in a book. You've got to give it to somebody. And so... Ultimately, what I want to say to everybody, and in, in to <laughs> terribly paraphrase T.S. Eliot, if you wake up and you say, dare, do I dare, do I dare, the answer is absolutely fucking lutely dare to disturb the universe. Thank you. <laughs>